Hey, what's up? You're tuned into The Cutting Room, the show where we talk to industry-leading marketing professionals about their content marketing philosophy, process, and pregame before they edit an article live. I'm your host, Tommy Walker, and thank you so much for tuning in. Now, due to the live nature of this show, uh, we've unfortunately had a last-minute cancellation, which has made it so we had to change the subject of the conversation. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about something that is very near and dear to my heart, which is hiring A-tier freelancers. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background in my uh, work, I have worked with Shopify Plus. I was the global editor-in-chief over at QuickBooks, and I have worked with a number of other companies such as GoDaddy, Twitch, and more. And in that entire time... I have worked with mostly freelancers, and those freelancers have been Emmy Award winners. They've been uh, New York Times published authors. They've been Four Dummies authors, and they've written for a lot of different high-value publications. And the way that that has happened, right, if we talk about the philosophy, if we keep to the structure of the show, the, my philosophy behind the people that I've worked with has always been to be very, very helpful uh, with these people, realizing that this game, right, this freelancing world is their livelihood. And I think the major thing that I like to realize is that it is completely necessary to work with freelancers because they have this broader view of what's happening within the space that they're in, right? So for example, I've worked with a number of different freelancers who work with uh, accounting software, they work with uh, production or product uh, management software, they work with um, uh, blogs about small businesses, and What's been really cool about working with these people is that they are very dialed in to the audience that they're talking to because this is how they make their money. Now, as somebody who's worked in-house, I have noticed that it's very easy for people who work in-house to get myopic, right? It's very easy to see uh, tunnel vision and realize that it's it's just about that business. And with freelancers, it's very, very cool to know that they have this amazing perspective across the board. They can see a little bit more of everything. And if we tap into that, right, if we're able to tap into that nature of people with a much broader view, uh, instead of looking at it as a very transactional relationship, we're able to leverage that knowledge and get them to help us see broader than what we normally would and help us get out of our, our own heads or out of our own way. Um, so Mega asks here, uh, how many tiers do you, or how many years do you think it takes to get a, get to a tier uh, level? Honestly, as a freelance writer, the inferiority, inferiority complex is overwhelming. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think what it comes down to, I've seen people do it within the span of a year. I've seen people do it within the span of five years. Uh, it can take a long time. And uh, as somebody who, when I was freelancing, would be considered a A-tier freelancer, some of it comes down to just the projects that you have, right? The projects that you've taken and who you're going after. Now, that's not necessarily on... Uh, the freelancer, though, to have that, right? What's really important about becoming an A-tier freelancer is also the editorial uh, person that you're working with and making sure that they have very clear standards, right? Now, since this show is geared towards more of the uh, content marketing lead, I think what's important is, and as a freelancer, maybe you can help encourage this, is to have a set of editorial standards where it's very clear on the soul, the philosophy behind the blog, what it is that you're trying to do uh, and the message that you're trying to get out there. And I think as a freelancer, if you're able to get these answers, right? If you're able to ask the questions that get people to start thinking about this, right? Think beyond 
just the uh, transactional nature of the relationship, but what are some of the questions? What are the overarching goals? What are the guiding themes that they're trying to go after, right? A lot of times it's very easy to forget about that, to, to lose um, focus, right? Because we're all focused on, let's go after this big old keyword list. Let's, um, let's, let's really think about, you know, getting the production, right? Getting production, let's put out another article, let's put out another article and hitting this cycle. And as a freelancer, right? Because this is who's here right now, you're here right now. If you're able to get somebody outside of their head, right? And start thinking in this way of asking these questions of the content and the stuff that you're producing and pushing that person to go the other way, this is the way that you become a tier, right? You, you start to be less of a transactional relationship and more of a consultative relationship by asking these questions and making sure that everybody is on the same page. Yeah. All right, cool. I'm glad that that's helpful. And as a content marketing lead, right? If you're a lead that's watching right now, what's really important is that you have a set of standards that you've put out there to the world where it's codified, where you know that this is how you talk to your audience. How do you engage with your audience? So for example, when I was at Shopify, I wrote something called a content code. And that content code wasn't, uh, you know, our articles need to be 1,850 words and put an image every few paragraphs, though that was important and something that was separate. This was a set of rules on how we engaged with our audience based on the, uh, based on the market research that we had done and what we had seen more broadly. And our rules were along the lines of don't talk down to the reader, right? Opinions are BS. Do the research, three drafts, be persistent, right? And the way that this document was created was written in a way that we would want to engage with the audience, right? It was, it was very much a show, don't tell type scenario. And it gave everybody a very strong idea of the message that we were trying to put out there into the world and, and how we were um, trying to communicate with our market. Right. It, it, it wasn't like a mission statement. It was more along the lines of this is how we want people to feel when they leave. Right. And that's important. I think that's really important because if you're hiring a freelancer, right, you need to have this foundation in place when you go to create your job ad. Right. A lot of job ads that are out there are along the lines of, you know, we're looking for these types of articles and, you know, we want, you know, five blog posts a month and they have to be keyword optimized and, and all of this. But really, if you know strongly about what it is that you're trying to do and you can communicate that, right, people are going to get on board with that. Daniel says, being an A-tier freelancer is certainly about setting standards and more importantly, sticking to those standards. That's great, right? And I absolutely agree with that, Daniel. You and I have worked together and this is very, very true. As the freelancer, right? You have to have your own set of standards, right? And it's very, very easy to um, pull back on those standards and try to kowtow, if you will, to the person because they think they know what they want. And in some cases people do. And there is that sort of, if you're trying to get started and you have to make your money, yeah, do what you've got to do there. But if you are somebody who has a set of standards and you know what it is that you're trying to do with yourself personally, you can't, you have to push beyond what that person is asking for what what that person is trying to do right so does that make sense right there's a very small group of us here right now so i'd like to take the opportunity to really just answer any questions along these lines or talk about it this way because i think it's it's something that 
is really important uh, to both careers, but also to the content that we create. Now, if we're going to talk about how do I vet such writers, that's actually what I was going to talk about next. So when we, um, when I, my process for hiring, right? Cause I've worked with New York times published authors and Emmy award winners and four dummies authors. When I've, my hiring process has always involved uh, setting this set of standards first, right? Doing the market research, finding out how I'm going to engage with this market, looking at the ways that I can jab where other people are weak and find their, uh, find their weak points and creating sort of a voice and a tone and a message around that, right? And, and the code that we were talking about. The next part of that is writing an ad that sits in that, that communicates very clearly and still in the same style that what I'm looking to do. Now, I've done this on problogger.com. This was where I've seen the most success, to be honest with you. Um, and what happens from that point, right, is I'll get a short list of authors. Uh, people will submit, you know, a ton of different uh, articles, and I ask for three different of the most representative articles, and I start to do a process of elimination. There are certain people who say, here's a link to my ent entire portfolio. Uh, you're DQ'd. Right. I don't want to see your entire portfolio. I want to see three of your most representative articles. After I've created my short list, I go through and it's a completely unscalable process. I haven't done this in a little while, but it's totally unscalable where I take one of these articles that has already been published and go through a full deep edit. And I give this, uh, this insight ahead of time where I say, hey, look, I'm a really tough editor. But this is, I'm going to do a deep edit on this article to make sure that we get along or we, we can understand my editorial style and if that's something that works with you, right? And depending on the feedback that I'll get back after that, that's going to be one of the major deciding factors as to whether or not we work together because not only does this person, I need to know if the person I'm working with can take feedback and look at that feedback and say, yes, I understand. This is something that we're trying to do together. You're trying to help me develop as an author. Personally, I am invested in the people that I work with and, and I try to be as empathetic as possible uh, and realize that this is somebody's livelihood, uh, which for anybody who's in-house right now, that's something to really think about. Uh, instead of looking at it as, as a transactional relationship, it's more about the humanity. This is a very deep relationship. You're the first reader. Um, and it's a very personal thing because you're looking at the interpretation or how somebody interprets the information uh, that they've put out there and, and how it's processed. Um, so for me, just to get back to the question, this is the link to Amanda Natividad. Uh, James, I do apologize uh, we did have a last minute cancellation with Amanda, unfortunately. So if you are, uh, expecting Amanda, um, she won't be here, uh, because she had to cancel last minute. So this is more of a conversation about, uh, hiring a tier freelancers. Um, I will not take it personally if you decide that this is not a talk for you. So. To get back to that, I will go through a full deep edit to see how that conversation uh, works out between the two of us. And from there, uh, we will have a conversation. We'll schedule a meeting and say, hey, this is, this is something that, uh, you know, here's the mission that we're on. I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. How'd you get into what you're doing um, and, and all of that. And what I found is that when we have this type of relationship, when we can develop this personal conversation, again, it's about being invested in this other person and their success, um, we're able to separate the person from the work, right? And we can look at the work very objectively and say, how can we make this better? And how can we go after this mission that we've been trying to communicate, right? That we're trying to go after 
and stand out and differentiate? And how can I break you of patterns, right? And breaking sounds a little bit intense, but how can we break patterns that make it so you sound like yourself, that you can be authentic and that we can have a cohesive team uh, conversation together and uh, also work together in a way that uh, that's going to create something that's going to be both beneficial for your career and for my career and the publishing that we're trying to put together. Uh, I do see that we have some new people who's jumped onto the stream. So I'm just going to say again, um, yeah, exactly. That unfortunately we did have a last minute cancellation. So on, uh, Amanda will not be here today, but we are having a discussion about uh, hiring a tier freelancers and managing a tier freelancers. Um, Daniel, you and I have worked together, and I think that this is something that, you know, maybe you can put into the chat what this has been like on the other side, because it it is this, the nature of the game is about trust. And as content leaders, we have to really talk about that trust and really think about that trust and get beyond the transactional nature of this and really respect that people have a wider scope and that their perspective is something that can be very valuable to the overall business, right? I don't really know what to say beyond that, just that if you're going to hire and manage a tier freelancers, it's about respecting that talent. It's about going beyond the, uh, beyond that. And, and, and making sure that you are properly signposting, I suppose, if you will, um, the mission that you're on. I think one of the things that I found in talking to the people that I've talked to is that it's a lot of people just don't know what they want. They don't know what they're trying to go after. And we're all going after samey, samey type content. We're asking for the same things. We're remixing, you know, different blog posts that are out there and using the same research and, it gets boring, right? And you want people to challenge themselves. And as somebody who's trying to become A tier, you want to challenge yourself. You need to have your own set of standards that are going, you know, going out there and and um, that's attached to your brand, your voice, right? And who it is that you're trying to be in the space. Now, again, this is live. This is sort of. Uh, I, I want to make the most of the format here. So I would love to answer any questions that are happening here. Now, let's. there's a, a bit of a delay, but I would love to answer any questions uh, along this because there's a really, I've got a lot of experience in this area and it's something I could ramble on for for days, but I want to make sure that this conversation is still very valuable overall because again, it was last minute, so I'm trying to like fill the time. Um, do you think, there we go. Okay, so Heather asked, do you think including a content trial is a good way to go about judging a writer's skills before onboarding? No. Um, I, 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 and the reason for that is, and, and I am probably in the, the minority on this, but I have never done a test. And the reason I've never done the test is exactly for what I was talking about before, where I want to see somebody's most representative work. I'm asking for their most representative work early on in the process. So I can do an edit and get a sense of what that person's skill is, regardless of the subject matter. Because there is a difference between uh, a good writer and somebody who understands the subject really well. A good writer right, is more of a journalist than they are a columnist, to steal some stuff from John Benini, where they're able to interpret the subject matter and create in a way that it, it puts it out there. I think that a good writer is able to do that. Uh, really well. Uh, tests have always been a waste of my time. And, and this is just my opinion, but they've always been a waste of my time and the author because I want to understand not do they understand the subject matter, but are they able to create and interpret what it is that we're talking about? And can they take feedback? Um, yeah, we had an instant connection. Uh, you, I mentioned Pro Blogger where I must have received a lot of applications. What exactly do I look for in the samples to shortlist the freelancers before the editing part? That is a great question. Um, I can generally tell within the first two to 300 words whether or not somebody's gonna get it. And I think 
for me, it's can you hook me? Um, can you get me to go down the page and can you structure this particular piece in a way that makes sense, right? As a first time reader, uh, in, in some cases where I'm not familiar with the subject matter, are you able to present this information in a way where I can understand what it is, right? And then what I'm looking at as I go through is uh, what are the gaps in the information that I'm going through? And, and what, do I, what do I see that's, um, or what am I not seeing? What's the story that's not being told? And what I've found is that people who are appreciative of that type of feedback are the ones where it's like, okay, let's work together. Um, and I did, I received in, when, when I was doing Shopify, when, when, when we did this at QuickBooks too, it was like 145 applications within the first 24 hours. Um, and I'm looking for, yeah, I'm looking for structure. I'm looking for the ability to hook me, to keep me engaged. I'm looking for, um, are you able to uh, just yeah, keep me engaged? Um, are you using visuals where visuals are necessary? Are you presenting the information and interpreting it in a way that goes beyond just what is the same in every other search? I want to see things that make me think. I want to see things that get me thinking on a few different levels. Like, is this, you know, I, I try to think about the three voices that we we talk to ourselves about, especially when it comes to something like how-to content, where it's, I'm reading the information that's on the page, and can that information come off the page, one. Two, am I thinking to myself, hey, this is something that I'm capable of doing? And then three, uh, what will the results be as I'm going through that? Right. And I believe that every person, as we um, as we read really good content, it's got us thinking about this stuff. Right. We're not we're thinking beyond just what's on the page We're we're having a few different conversations with ourselves about what's happening. And it's about the immersion. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody's ability to even slightly immerse me as I'm going through their pieces because that's where I know that there's potential. That's where I know that we can, you know, now that I know what I want and I know that they can have some level of ability to uh, immerse me, um, then, then that's where I know uh, that it's something that we can do uh, or that we'll, we're well, well, we will work well together. Um, has my vetting process ever let me down? Yes. Um, very rarely, but, but yes, I have worked with a couple of people, not with the, with the work that they turned in, but with the work ethic that they brought to the table. Um, I have worked with people who unfortunately, uh, at, at a certain point, weren't able to take the editorial feedback, which is fine, you know, at, to a certain point. I, I do encourage people to push back um, and that's fine. I don't mind pushing back because I'm not the, I'm not the end all be all. Um, but I have vetted people who did not have a solid work ethic, who did not get back uh, their edits in time, um, who didn't necessarily over the long term take the editorial feedback in a way that was constructive. Um, and and that's unfortunate, but this is also over the span of a much longer period of time in the relationship. Uh, generally speaking, I've had a very good success rate with the people that I've worked with uh, early on because the way that I liken it, right? Uh, because I have a very specific set of standards that I'm working with people, um, it's kind of like that teacher, right? That you don't want to let down when you were there. And I, and I, I don't want to put myself in that like higher position, but it, that's really what it is, is I've got this set of expectations. I know what those expectations are. They know what those expectations are. I'm trying to push people slightly beyond where their comfort zone is because that's how we all get better. That's how I get better at my job. Um, and, and we're all trying to rise to the occasion together. And, you know, Daniel, you and I have worked together. It's, it's, you know, the context was a little bit different because we weren't writing together, but I think you still know this, that 
that it is. It's just it's just push a little bit beyond your comfort zone and you do it in a way that is comfortable, right? But you both know that you're trying to get better at what you're doing. And to go back to your original question earlier, Mega, I think that's how you become an A-tier freelancer overall is that you're constantly pushing yourself a little bit further. You're trying to go a little bit above and beyond. You're at, even if you're not getting paid the way that you think you should be paid for it, everything you do is always trying to top the last one, right? You're always trying to push a little bit further. You're always going beyond your comfort zone. Because if not, how do you get better, right? It's very easy to become disengaged with this work. You're trying to like, if you're, if you're trying to, to get paid on a regular basis and pay your bills, um, which is totally understandable, you have to also break your own patterns and get out of your own comfort zone to uh, stretch yourself, make it better. So I'm going to pull it back. Uh, and again, I do apologize for the informal nature of the conversation and that I'm just rambling here. But um, when I was freelancing way back in the day, when I was writing for Conversion XL, uh, specifically, Pep Laya was the most brutal editor I have ever worked with. Uh, I can't tell you on how many occasions he made me cry. Like I would put my head down on my desk and just bang it across my desk because I had no idea how to push this thing a little bit further. And what I tried to do, uh, because I also was getting paid, I think it was like $200 an article. Um, and the situation that I was in personally, like it really, like we really needed all of the money and as quickly as possible. Um, every post needed to be, my first draft always needed to be the, the best draft that I could possibly put together. And the next draft had to be better than that. And I was doing my absolute best. Yeah, uh, Daniel has been there. Um, doing my absolute best to just make sure that that next thing was always going to be better. And that's because I knew, right? Those standards were in place that I knew something wouldn't be accepted if, if it wasn't there. Uh, Kara says, my challenge is my client's B2B case study edits and final version may not represent my preferred style, tone, or structure. Should I then share my not final or approved version with a prospect? Um, I'm not sure. So Kara, could you specify, are you, you're a freelancer, I assume, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a, that might not be the best that the, the client relationship might not be the best client. Uh, I hate to say that, but the, there's, there's two parts to that. One, are they being clear with their expectations overall? So that's the part that's on them. And then two, are you amenable? Right. Um, and I think what's important in that is that, it's, it's a trust thing, right? If they don't have clear expectations of what it is that they want, then as an editor, it's really easy to get locked into this um, loop of, that's great, but that's not how we'd say it, right? And it's like, that's a mismatch. And that's a mismatch that's not necessarily on you. That's on them for uh, hiring somebody that they have to constantly edit. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you're amenable and that's something that you're willing to you know do so you can make the money um but i think what's also important there is hold on just a moment dribble your style yeah um yeah i think the overall idea is and this kind of goes back to what i was talking about it goes a little bit back before is if you have strong ideas on what that person's market is, go above and beyond and let them know why, and in a not competitive way, and this is a, a hard line to toe, but 
what you're seeing in the research, what you're seeing more broadly in the market and how these other competitors might be presenting their information. And this is why you're putting the information out the way you are. Um, that's something that might be really important to sort of communicate and go beyond just the transactional nature of the relationship and be a little bit more consultative as somebody who's worked in house, right? Cause I've done both. Um, yeah, I, I, I've done both. Um, and I can say that it becomes very easy to get myopic and only look at what we're doing and, and forget to look at what the rest of the market broadly is saying. Um, and how actual readers are paying attention to this stuff. So, uh, Kart, you say, I accept their changes, but it means my finals are never exactly what I would do. So not good to show prospects. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that. So you're talking about showing your next prospect, the next person, which makes total sense. And you don't want to end up in a position where you're saying to the next group, like, this isn't what I put out there. This is what the final edited version was. You want something that's a little bit more representative uh, of the work that you're doing. Totally cool. I would say that it's probably important to move beyond a body of work that's just the existing client that you have, right? Uh, what I would look for in that type of scenario is this is what the final edit looked like for the client. This is how you know, not necessarily this exact situation, right? But here's my preferred style, or here's how I approach case studies, uh, and, and here's why, right? Here's how I might approach a case study. Maybe you do, and this is one of those go above and beyond type things, maybe you do a, a fake case study based on what their product is, or, you know, a G2 review, or if they have reviews that are out there by existing customers, how could you frame that as a story that would be interesting to the next person who's, you know, who you're trying to go after, right? I think that's important because it comes down to your own, uh, your own editorial style or your own writing style, um, and you're giving rationale behind it. Uh, but it's very easy, again, for us to just take what we're given if you're a freelancer it's very easy to take what you're given and, you know, accept all edits, accept all the green lines and not really, uh, and then just try to move on because you're trying to make your money. Yeah, I think that's what I would say to that. I would, you know, you could rewrite their case studies. Yeah, exactly. Like what I care about in, in these types of situations, because normally I'm, I'm only accepting, I very rarely accept uh, cold pitches from people. But what, what I'd be looking at is how can you bring something that's unique to the table and how can we find a middle ground between the voice that I already have and the voice that I might not even know what I'm looking to get, right? Um, just, just on a slightly different note, uh, I've rewritten other people's... Uh, uh, job ads for freelancers and for full-time hires. And it's a lot of it's just repositioning what it is that they're looking to do. And you can do the exact same thing with the stuff that they're already creating. They have an idea behind what it is that they want to do. But if they were, if they were hiring freelancers, they, they maybe can't quite get to where they want to be. It's that gap right of where they are and where they want to be and hopefully you can help them bridge that gap and it's not just giving them words it's it's going uh, a little bit more beyond and being a little bit more consultative about that um so you say i always explain why their edits are a challenge too long hard to understand etc but ultimately is it is their case study yeah that's a tough situation that that really is because it it, it becomes it becomes a more adversarial or combative relationship or it can it can very easily get into that territory and uh yeah we don't we don't necessarily want to get there and that might be i don't know if it's this particular client or multiple clients um 
because that does change the situation. So uh, that that does change things overall. Uh, Mega says, what's your process for managing the writers and the workflow to keep everything organized? Yes. Thank you for bringing this back, bringing it back to the overall uh, structure of what I wanted to talk about. Um, my process for managing authors, I use, so Airtable is my jam. Uh, and I can actually show you uh, a little bit of what I'm working on right now. Um, the overall guiding philosophy behind what I have for uh, the way that we do our, our work and, and workflow and process is to make sure that people are only getting the information that they need when they need to get it. And let's see, let me just pull up uh, something here on what I'm working on currently, or I'll show you an example. I can't show you exactly what that is, but I'll do an example. So the way that I break this down, let me do a screen share here. The way that I first try to break everything down is into these individual steps that are uh, identified or the individual steps of the uh, editorial process. So over here, uh, I think you can see, hope you can see, we've got, uh, oh boy, it's too big. We've got a handful of different things happening here. So um, I use Airtable because it allows me to very easily uh, separate my uh, the, the things that we're doing by different steps of the process. So at the very early beginning part of the process, I, I break down the, the life cycle of a piece of content. So we've got ideas validated in production for review, second draft, upload, scheduled, publish, uh, revise and review, et cetera. And the idea here is that we can capture all of the information that we need right here in ideas, right? And as things move forward, we've got the status that allows me to say, okay, the idea is here. We validated the idea. We put things into production. We do it for review um, and so forth and so on. And when we do this process, um, the, again, the overarching idea is that we're able to keep people on track for where it is that they need to be or, or only bring them in when that you know, when they're uh, ready there. So for example, if an idea has been validated, right, we can see it leaves this ideas view and it moves over to this validated view. And when I go to uh, assign a person uh, some work, right, uh, I am able to automatically um, add that person, right? So in this case, uh, I'd add that person to the, the record. That person will then get notified in Slack. And then they can be brought either directly to the record or I have automation set up where it will uh, automatically attach a draft uh, to the record and they can be brought directly to the draft. At scale, and this is how I've been able to scale my operations out to 16 different markets with 40 plus contributors, um, at scale, we're only assigning people like as an editor, I'm only assigning people as these, uh, as these projects are ready to go. And as they come in and they're getting notified where they already are, right. They're getting notified in Slack where they're already spending most of their day. They're not having to check up on this. They're not having to go into their email, um, all the time. They are able to just be brought in where they are now to do this at scale. Right? We have these automations in place, but we also have automations in place that if we were to, and I've got another uh, thing right here, that, or another base that I'm working on right now that I can't show, but we can do content briefs in here, and the content brief will automatically populate the draft. Right, So we don't even have to spend a lot of time doing double entry or anything like that. We're just putting the information in one place, and then it's moving from place to place uh, throughout the different steps of the process. We can bring multiple people in, and then from a, from a structural standpoint, 
The only thing I have to do is bring in more people and potentially more editors um, and say, are we doing this based on vertical or what's our editorial sort of structure look like overall? Um, the other thing that I do with these is uh, I work off of a big old keyword list, right? So uh, a lot of times we'll see with content teams, uh, if they work with SEO teams, they'll have the keyword list in one Google sheet and they have, um, it, it's all in multiple places. And what I do here is we'll have the big old keyword list. And if we want to put something into production, right, we'll say like best CFD trading platform. Cool. Uh, we can do that. And if there is no uh, existing record, all of this information is linked on this side over here. So let's just say best CFD trading platform, right? This is why I love Airtable. I can now add a new record. This record is now linked over to this table and I can put this into in production. I can talk about the topic. It's got the big, it's got all the information here. Uh, the draft is attached here. And then I can start putting the right people in here, due date. Right. And if we look over here, uh, let's see, what did I have that as? All right, we'll say in production. Now, when I look at over here in production, uh, we can see that that record that I just created is over here. And I can start to assign whoever it is that's going to be writing it uh, right, from, right from that record. I also, in this... Uh, in there, I keep track of all my authors, right? Uh, I have automation set up where it will take the, uh, the RSS feed and it will automatically update all of the different pieces that have been published. Uh, this right here, this isn't a necessary um, automation to be looking at, but the idea, the guiding philosophy behind all of it is to make sure people are getting only the information they need in, those, in the places that they're already spending their time. Um, the other part of that is also making sure that people are working the way they wanna work. So uh, for example, we might have to work with legal teams. Hi, David. Uh, we might have to work with legal teams to get legal approval and uh, some legal teams like to give their approval in batch and other legal teams like to get their approvals um, or do their approvals ad hoc understanding how people want to work, right, and not forcing them to work as part of my system helps out. So one of the things that Airtable allows me to do that I think is really great is I can very easily create a digest of the information and say, you know, anything that has is in the status of legal approval or is checked off on legal approval, uh, send a digest to them once a week to their email, and then they can be brought straight to all of the different drafts and they can leave all of their approvals and remarks uh, all, in, all in one place and in the way that they like to work, right? So a lot of this type of conversation about scaling production across different teams and across different people uh, is about understanding how people like to work and, and bringing that, again, it's about bringing the information to where it is that they want to be. Uh, David, thank you for, for joining here. I don't know if you were tuning in originally for Amanda, uh, we did have a last minute cancellation. So uh, we do have, um, we did have to change up our plans a little bit, but I would love to answer any questions that you might have uh, about hiring A tier freelancers or managing the production process uh, or anything along those lines. Yeah. So I, again, I think what's the most important about this entire relationship is from a freelancer's perspective, becoming a little bit more consultative, bringing your perspective to the table and giving those conversations, understanding, uh, understanding what's going on in the market overall a little bit more broadly and bringing that into the, to the table. Um, Okay, something that just occurred to me is 
also uh, the the process for actually creating content, right? What do we do? What's that process look like for creating content? And here's what I've done in the past um, is once a week, right? Depending on the team, once a week, we will have a brainstorm where we have a theme for what we're trying to do for the upcoming month. And in that, we'll talk about uh, everything that we're trying to do based on the theme that we're looking at. I ask people for ideas uh, in advance, and I also ask for, and then we bounce some of these ideas off of each other when we're having our, our team meeting. Um, and what we're looking for in that team meeting and, and the ground rules of that are, uh, we're just putting out ideas. We're not looking to judge these ideas right away. We're just putting things out. And we want to have these discussions. You know, we'll have what I what I call the green zone and the red zone. And in the green zone, it's just ideas, right? We're just talking about stuff and, and why we're coming up with these conversations and why we're thinking about this. And then we, what happens naturally in this, you know, when we're in the green zone is there are people who go, hey, this is a really solid idea, right? And, and people get excited about that. So when we move over to the red zone, we start to apply pressure to those ideas, right? We talk about the different things that we would want to see out of a piece like that. And what happens inevitably is almost a process of natural selection when it comes to these ideas. We come up with these really solid premises or premises uh, for these ideas and why people would want to click on this, why what they might expect out of a piece like this, what the what the headline to it might be. Not as prescriptive, but something on what the idea is and, and how is that going to be interesting to that group of people that would be clicking on it and why, again, yeah, why? why? Why is this a good idea? And why should we put it in production? Can we defend these ideas? Heather says, how do you keep freelancers? Within house, there are promotions, raises, but what incentive do you offer freelancers to continue to work together to maintain the best talent? Um, Daniel, if you're still on the stream, I would love your input on this as well, because I only I have my ideas, but you definitely stuck with me for a very long time when we were working together. Uh, so I'd love to get your take on this. Um, but for me, it, it, it's about the relationship. Right. Anytime I've worked with people, uh, I, I've I've worked with a lot of the same people for the last six, seven years. And what it's what I found is that it's about being invested, you know, looking at it beyond just the transactional relationship and just being invested in their personal success, their I mean, whatever they're willing to share in their personal lives, um, being compassionate and uh and and helping progress helping to progress their career i think that's one of the things that's really helped uh me in the past and what's helped others in the past is that i'm willing to make connections where connections can be made uh, i'm willing to you know uh be supportive where i can be supportive um and it goes kind of to what i was saying before about pushing from that developmental standpoint uh, to having higher expectations and setting those expectations so we have a strong working relationship on how to get better. And in some cases, uh, you know, there, there might be a promotion of sorts where I ask people, I ask everybody, hey, what is it, you know, essentially, what is it that you want to be when you grow up, right? Where would you, how do you want to develop your career? And I try to find ways where I can help do that. So most of it is relational. Um, and then in other cases, it's like, how can we take this relationship to the next level? And in some cases I've hired people to become my deputy editor. Some of my star authors who have said, you know, I want to become a better author. Well, I found the best way to become a better author and I need help with this is to become a good editor, um, or to edit other people. So there's that. The other part is, uh, the working relationship itself. So one of the things that I've done with my teams, and it's not always, um, this, this hasn't always been the case, but it's about making it a little fun, right? Um, so for example, uh, when I have people that I'm working with on a regular basis, once a week, we'll take a stock image of somebody who looks like they're doing a job of some sort. And it's not like a 
like a silly stock image. It's one where it actually looks like that. And I'll ask in Slack, hey, give me give me five minutes and tell me a story about who this person is, um, why they're doing what they're doing, and all of that. And it does not have to be related to the company. It's not like, why do they use our product or anything like that? It's it's tell me about this person. Give me, you know, why did they get into this? Why do they continue to do it? What struggles have they had? And getting them really inside the head of the person and starting to think about who it is that we're writing for, right? And what I've done is I've said, okay, now after we have all this, will uh, everybody take, you know, a couple seconds and vote using an emoji, a re reaction emoji to the stories that you like the most and whoever wins gets a $10 Amazon gift card, right? Or, you know, a, a Starbucks card or whatever, right? It's something small on my part. It's 10 bucks, you know, it, it, which is really nothing, but it, it keeps people engaged uh, in the process and invested in the work that they're doing. Because I think that's the hardest part is, you know, having freelanced myself for a long time, it can be really hard to get invested in the relationship. It can be really hard to, um, when we look at it from the transactional standpoint, it's, it's becomes really hard to get in, invested. It's hard for me to want to do better. Uh, and, I think maybe part of it's just who I am too as a person. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's going beyond business speak and saying, Hey, we need articles that are like this and like really becoming invested in the people that you're working with. Does that help Heather? So, yeah, that's really it for me. The other part is, and and this is, I think, something that uh, I let people know, too, is there's oftentimes a buffer that needs to happen between the person and the, the, the company, right? And I try my absolute best to keep my freelancers um, happy and to keep them protected, if you will, uh, from the rest of the company, if that's necessary, and, and let them know that I'm willing to fight for them. Uh, again, it, it's a relationship thing, right? Can I, am I willing to fight for them? And if I have to have a last minute turnaround, can I be respectful that this is, you know, they're not working for me? It's not any of that. It's a matter of going like, Hey, I, I really need this. This is something that happens. If it can't happen, that's fine. I'll take care of it. But because the relationship is there in place, oftentimes it hasn't been an issue. And when it comes to a certain point, I'll say, you know, if, if I feel like they are deserving, if you will, of, uh, of getting a raise, right, then I'll say, hey, let's increase your rate. Right. Like, let's let's see. What would you say is a fair increase in rate? Let's go back and forth on this a little bit. I probably won't be able to get you what you want. But at the same time, I'll do my absolute best and we'll find some middle ground. Right. And that transparency, that honesty, I think, has always been appreciated. Um, and and I think that's really where that's at. Uh, so to sum it all up, because we have about five minutes left here, uh, the way to hire freelancers, A tier freelancers, is to be very clear about the expectations that you have of the publication that you're running, uh, to have an editorial process that is very clear and it does not waste people's time and to be responsive with feedback and give people the ability to uh, see what else is happening. And then be really invested, not in just the work that you're doing, but in the people who are doing it. Uh, you know, it's, I think that's the most important piece is just being a decent human being, um, and, and being a real person when it comes to all this. Uh, we have a few minutes left. So if there are any other questions, I would love to answer those. That's such an excellent leadership style. Yeah. Uh, uplifting and empathetic. Thank you. Um, that's the thing that I try to encourage the most is just, you know, 
respecting the intimacy of the relationship too. I, I, I kind of touched on that just a little bit, but as an author, it can be a very vulnerable thing. Somebody is judging how you write, right? And, and that relationship of me judging how you write and how you do your work and how you interpret the information, it's personal, right? Are you a good writer? I put a lot of work and effort into this. You know, you put a lot of work and effort into this. And how can we respect to that and not just look at it as, um, you know, here's the work that we're trying to put out and let me just, you know, poo poo all over it. If that's what, what ends up happening. And it's like, no, we have to respect that. And we have to respect that there are lives that are happening and that there are deadlines and that there's like a whole lot more. It's beyond the work. It's not just, you know, this is a thing. It's, it's just a thing that we use to, to make money. We're all just trying to get by uh, and do the work that we're trying to do. Um, and, and I think that's probably the biggest thing is just having respect uh, overall for the people who you're working with and trying to help develop a little bit further. So uh, yeah, we got two minutes left. If, uh, if anybody has any questions, this would be the time to do it. Uh, but if not, then thank you all for listening to me rant. Um, oh, uh, yeah. So Mega says, uh, would you say the best freelancers you've worked with have also had in-house experience? Yeah. Um, not necessarily as content marketers. I think some of the best people that I've worked with um, have, have, you know, one of the best people that I've worked with, they were a journalist and they they came to that with the journalism approach. They actually did all of our case studies. I wanted to match their talents up with uh, the, the work that I was trying to do. And I think that's also something that's really important if you want to keep A tier freelancers is like play to people's strengths. Um, so yeah, I mean, they've had in-house experience. Maybe it's in a completely different area. Uh, it's not even a necessary thing. It's not even something I necessarily even cared about. But, you know, have them been able to do a, a, a full-time job? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they've definitely had that. Well, cool. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for sticking around and hearing me ramble. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I don't think we're going to even have a replay on this episode, but I'm glad you were here for it live. All right. Have a great day, everybody.